In the town of Midwich, a mysterious entity travels through the sky and lands near the coast. Dr. Allen is woken up by a strange whispering-like noise, but his wife Barbara tells him it's just his imagination. Meanwhile Frank drops his wife Jill at the school she works at before driving out of town for a construction job. Lots of people in town visit the local school because they're having a lovely festival. When the clock hits 10 o'clock, suddenly everyone passes out on the spot, including pets and wild animals in the area. Many vehicles crash, and before Frank can cross the border, he gets affected too and his car explodes as he crashes too. Soon cops from other towns are sent to investigate the situation, and the first two that cross the border also fall asleep. While other officers paint a white line to mark the limit of the strange effect, special forces and scientists are sent to the area. Susan, an epidemiologist working for the government, is leading the group. Alan had also left for work and returns as soon as he hears the news, but he isn't allowed to walk into town. An officer puts on a mask and walks past the border, but as soon as he starts passing out, the others drag him back by using a rope. Alan wonders if this may be some kind of chemical gas, but Susan discards the idea, explaining the edges of the affected area are too exact. Suddenly the animals nearby start waking up, and exactly at 4 pm, every person and pet in town wakes up with no idea of what happened. There are a few signs that time passed like an overflowing tub and sadly, a man that burned down when he fell on his grill. The police and the special forces rush into town to carry on the investigation and the locals get startled by men in hazmat suits scanning the whole area for clues. As she tries to clear her head, Jill sees a truck pass by with Frank's destroyed car and immediately understands what it means. Sometime later, Jill starts feeling sick at work. Callie visits Alan because she's feeling sick as well, and she can't believe the diagnosis. At church, Reverend George finds Melanie crying her heart out. It turns out all the women in town are suddenly pregnant, and in many cases they have no explanation as to why. Callie's husband Ben has been away on a work trip, and Melanie has never been with a guy. Soon Ben comes back from his trip, but he isn't happy at all because he thinks his wife has cheated on him. After learning that Barbara is pregnant as well, Alan goes to see Jill, who is also expecting. He brings some worrisome news, all the pregnancies seem to have started on the day of the blackout. This news spreads around town and in the evening, all the locals gather at the meeting hall to discuss the issue. Some people think the babies are going to be deformed, but Alan assures them the tests have shown no abnormalities. Susan then makes a big announcement, if any woman wants to terminate the pregnancy they're free to, but those who decide to keep them will have all prenatal expenses paid and get $3,000 each month. The only rule is to let Susan watch and study the children on a regular basis. She also offers a medical team for those women who choose the termination. Once the meeting is over, Jill checks on Callie and learns Ben is moving out because he doesn't believe her story. Callie is starting to believe she may choose termination. That night, all the pregnant women dream of themselves with big bellies while a mysterious blue light surrounds them. The next day, Susan is shocked to learn every single woman is keeping the baby. Time passes and the pregnancies continue as normal, so the women take the usual motherhood classes. One night they all start having contractions at the same time so they are taken to a barn where Susan has set up a special maternity ward for the occasion. All the babies are born naturally at the exact same time, looking healthy and human. Ben even comes to be with Callie and their new son. Unfortunately there's an exception, Melanie is feeling very sick and taken to intensive care, where she gives birth to a stillborn. Susan immediately takes the dead fetus away to a van, which is noticed by George. When he demands an explanation, Susan says she wants to do an autopsy later and that she didn't want the other mothers to see a dead baby. Sometime later, Alan meets with Susan to discuss their observations. There are a few interesting things like the baby's hair being extra soft and their nails being narrower than normal. DNA tests so far have shown normal genetics but all the babies seem to have the same results, as if they were siblings from the same parent. Meanwhile Jill is at home with her boy when she discovers he can already spell his name with toys at such a young age. Barbara's daughter already looks much older and when she throws her food bowl on the ground, Barbara scolds her for it. The girl doesn't like this and her eyes start glowing to control Barbara's body, forcing her to put her arm in boiling water. As Barbara screams in pain, Jill arrives for a visit and pulls her out before she loses her hand. Later at the hospital, Barbara is too scared of her daughter to tell Alan what happened. When she's finally discharged, Barbara can't stand being home with the girl and crosses the woods to look at the ocean. Inside the house, the child senses this and uses her powers again, making Barbara fall off the cliff. Time passes and the babies grow into healthy but very creepy young children. They all have the same white hair, pale skin, blue eyes, and are very smart. However they don't seem to have individual personalities or empathy, always wearing the same blank face. They always move together in perfect lines and Alan's daughter Mara appears to be their leader. The kids have paired off like mates except for Jill's son David, whose mate was supposed to be the dead baby. This has caused him to become the outcast of the group. Susan reports to the government that there have been many incidents in the community resulting in adults getting severely wounded or even dying and it seems to be connected to the children, but there has been no physical violence involved. She wishes that Alan hadn't stopped helping her with the tests, but her priorities are still the same, 
to watch the children and follow their developing power since it's become a matter of national security. The government agrees to keep on funding her project. Sometime later, the children go to Susan's lab for their monthly tests. They admit they can read minds and that they're annoyed because Susan is trying to hide her thoughts by thinking of a wall. When an ophthalmologist checks a child's eyes, she notices a very strange color shift and gets so nervous that she accidentally grabs the wrong drops, causing the kid to scream in pain. The doctor immediately cleans the eye and looks at it again, noticing how it becomes red before Mara appears at her door with red eyes as well. Mara forces the doctor to empty the drops bottle in her own eyes, leaving her blind. Meanwhile Jill tells Alan they need to do something because the creepy kids don't belong in normal classes and are getting in the way of the normal kids' education. Jill wants Alan to teach them instead, especially to impart empathy, but Alan refuses. Later at home, Jill tries to brush David's hair, but he immediately stops her and says he's old enough to take care of himself. Then Jill tries to talk to him about what happened to the doctor and David begins to understand the concept of empathy. The next day, David walks away from the group, which is noticed by Mara. He goes to the cemetery and finds Melanie getting drunk. She can't stand looking at him and decides to leave, so David reads her mind and learns that lately Melanie has been considering self-deleting. In the meantime the other kids go to investigate the barn where they were born. Shortly afterward, Melanie ends things for herself as David predicted and during the funeral, George warns the locals about the possible evil nature of the kids. Later Alan goes to the cemetery and bumps into David, who admits to be looking for the dead baby's grave. Shocked by the fact the kids know about the missing baby even though nobody told them, Alan explains the dead baby isn't there and the two bond over having lost someone which teaches David more empathy. As Alan looks at Barbara's grave, David holds his hand. This encounter changes Alan's mind and he agrees to teach the children. During their first class, they answer Alan's questions at the same time, not understanding he speaks to each of them as individuals. They also know how to discuss philosophical concepts pretty well for their ages. Suddenly Alan is called by the principal so he starts telling the kids what to do, but they don't let him finish, by reading his mind, they already know what books to grab and what chapter to read. They all move at the same time in perfect synchronization as if they shared a mind. While Alan is gone, the janitor comes to the classroom to tell the kids he's onto them and threatens them with his broom. The handle ends up hitting one of the boys on the head and all the kids immediately stand up as the eyes start to glow. They use their power to make the janitor walk out of the classroom and climb a ladder to the roof to then push him off, causing him to fall on top of a car and get impaled on his own broom. Later at home, Mara tells Alan that there will be changes. Worried and scared, Alan goes to see Susan, who confirms the kids have a communal consciousness. She also reveals the same thing has happened in other countries, always in remote and isolated communities. Susan has many theories of what's going on, but her strongest one is that an extraterrestrial being is using humans as hosts to have children. She desperately wants Alan to work with her again and to convince him, she takes him to the basement, where she reveals the dead fetus, which has mutated into an ugly alien-like body. Alan becomes angry because she's been hiding this, so Susan explains she couldn't let the information slip considering the kids know how to read minds. Her knowing isn't a problem because she's practiced building a wall around her mind to keep them away, but the kids are growing more powerful and she won't hold on for much longer. Alan still refuses to return to the project and goes home, only to find Mara packing. She announces the kids have made a decision and they'll be living in the barn from now on. Mara also tells Alan he'll be in charge of bringing them supplies, not giving him the chance to argue against it. Later in the evening, the parents drop all the kids at the barn. Jill tries to convince David to stay with her, saying he's different. However David leaves anyway. A few days later, Ben makes his way to the barn, determined to pick up his daughter. A kid blocks the way and Ben almost runs over her, but he stops his truck just in time. As he comes out, the children surround him with glowing eyes and force Ben back into the truck to make him drive right into a fuel tank, causing a huge explosion that instantly kills him. At the same time, Susan shares some worrisome news with Alan, all the other towns with blackout children have been destroyed because their respective governments considered them too dangerous. They didn't even evacuate the adults because the children would know their plans and stop them. Susan has been told to get out of Midwich and she advises Alan to do the same. A desperate Alan goes to the barn to try to reach an understanding with the children, but they just say it's their biological obligation to survive. As the kids try to read his mind, Alan begins thinking about an ocean to block them out. Mara asks Alan to make arrangements to get them out of town tonight, and Alan pretends to agree before leaving. Afterward, Mara notices that David is thinking about the dead baby and calls him out for having emotions. Nearby, George hides in the tall grass and gets ready to shoot the kids, however they find him first and force him to self-delete. Moments later, Susan and her team are packing up while the locals begin gathering on the streets with torches to riot against the kids. A few children suddenly block their way and their eyes glow as they make a woman drop her torch to burn her down. Soon the cops start patrolling the town as they announce a state of emergency, threatening to arrest anyone still out on the streets. Meanwhile the other kids approach Susan in her office and make her reveal where she's hiding their dead sibling. The mere sight of it makes David very emotional and as revenge, the others make Susan lie down on a table and force her to self-delete with her own scalpel. 
Not far from there, Alan breaks into a construction company to steal some explosives before rushing to the school to check on Jill. He tells her he has a plan and kisses her before locking her up so she can't get hurt. However, as soon as Alan is gone, Jill breaks the window and escapes. She finds the burned body on the streets and takes her car keys to head to the barn. Minutes later the cops surround the barn, and all the kids except David come out with their eyes glowing. Forced by the children's powers, a cop shoots his partner and then starts shooting the incoming police cars, causing tons of crashes and explosions. The cops that manage to survive start shooting each other and a massacre ensues until nobody is left. There's also a police helicopter flying above them, but the children make it crash on the ground too. Eventually Alan arrives and hides the bomb inside a briefcase before meeting with the kids inside. Mara is suspicious of how nervous he looks and tries to read his mind, so Alan makes an extra effort to think of a wall and keep it up. The other kids join Mara to put their power together and go against Alan's defenses while Jill sneaks through the back, intending to take David with her. The kids sense her and make her stop before going back to Alan, who won't hold on for much longer. Jill tries to take David again, and when the kids turn their eyes on her, David pushes them and escapes with his mother. Then the kids turn on Alan again and bring their powers to the max to finally break Alan's mind wall but by the time they see the bomb is too late, the explosives go off and destroy the barn, killing all the children and Alan in the process. Jill and David survive and escape in a car, determined to find a place where nobody knows who they are.